Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 92 of the Citrix Session. I'm your host, Andy Whiteside. I got uh, Bill Sutton, just, just the two of us, Bill, back to the old days. How's it going? Going well, thanks. How are you? Good. You know, I always know that uh, as long as I can count on you being here and not to, not to say anything negative about the other guys, they're, they're awesome to have the extra context. Uh, they bring lots of ideas and questions and answers to the podcast when they're here. But uh, I think Ben and John both had things come up today, so they couldn't join us. But I know if you're here, I'm going to have not only theoretical, but real world examples of, of how it works and allows us to have a really you know, good conversation. Yep, hope so. Um, this is going to be an interesting one. Uh, and actually, I think maybe this is one where we don't have a lot of uh, real world scenarios yet. It's kind of new. Um, today, we are talking about actually another podcast, uh, The Click Down, done by uh, Anna, Anna Ruiz and uh, Dan Feller and others, where they talk about, um, well, let me give a title. The Click Down is the name of the podcast. And this is called the Launchpad series, which we talked about Launchpad last week. Uh, Citrix image portability and PVS on public cloud. You and I have brought up PVS a bunch. We go way back, uh, back when we did it all bare metal. That's uh, right. When Citrix acquired the product from whom? Whom was it they bought it from? Ardents. Ardents. Yep. So we go back. We're 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 old school PVS guys. Uh, we need to talk about here where it fits in the cloud, public cloud, and why you would do that. So I apologize in advance if we make anybody mad for talking ugly about PVS. Um, <laughs> historically, I'm a huge fan of it and it's loved funny. what it did in the beginning and still love it today. I think my challenges with it historically has been that uh, that networking layer that I didn't control. I'll tell you one quick story. I, I probably had one of the largest implementations of Citrix provisioning services to physical endpoints uh, we had one lab with uh, 250 devices. We had another lab with 50 devices and another lab with 30 devices. Uh, I've got a customer that just retired their labs on PVS uh, within the last month or two uh, during the wow. pandemic because nobody was using it. Um, huge fan of it. However, um, the complexity of it, the dependencies on the network, um, for me, most virtual app and desktop implementations have gone to MCS in a case where I could build out something like Nutanix or some type of hyperconverge. What's your, what's your take on old school PVS? And by old school, I mean physical endpoints, which that should be pretty much a, a, a moot point, uh, maybe. Uh, and uh, your take on using it for VDI uh, and virtual app and desktop workloads today versus let's say MCS. Well, as far as physical workloads, you know, as you recall, the, the big challenge with that outside of the networking was the, the every device needed to be the, in theory the same or almost the same uh, to support the image. You had to have same device drivers and all the, the complexity that went along with having to uh, to manage physical physical devices. Obviously, when we applied the virtualization layer, a lot of that was reduced significantly, if not eliminated. Uh, but that Let's networking that networking. Um, well, before you move on, let's hit on that real quick. Cause yep. yeah, I was, yeah, you just pointed that out. Right. I mean, if I'm in Azure, right. I assume my tools and drivers I need are going to be all the same. So that's, that's actually a big hurdle that we don't have to overcome anymore. Right. Absolutely. Yep. I mean, I, I, when you talk about projects that I, I had one years ago with an insurance company, um, PBS for delivering session host servers on VMware. Um, and we set it up. It was I set it up in like less than two days. Had everything set up, working. It was I let it and I let it bake overnight. And I came back the next morning and had like twenty thousand retries mm. on the V disk, uh, and the performance was terrible. And we spent weeks. They spent weeks trying to figure it out. And it turned out they had a loop in their network. Somebody had run a cable literally from one side of the data center to the other side of the data center and created a network loop. Yep. Um, and that caused all this ret retries and retransmissions and. Yeah. nearly killed the project but mcs was was obviously more storage based or is more storage based and certainly uh, much much simpler because it doesn't have that networking component but the the biggest advantage in my view of pbs as you know is is the ability to just really quickly and easily roll back and roll forward because uh, it's it, those images or those snapshots versions they call them uh, are so easy to manipulate yeah well, and, and we've had a lot of experience lately with um, um, MCS on top of hyperconverged stuff like Nutanix and the roll forward and roll back is not instant, uh, but it's still pretty quick. But you, you, point out, you point out a couple of things there. The idea that you can roll forward and back and back is the key, right? When, you, when it's like, uh-oh, that didn't work. 
uh, and we need to roll back. PVS is super quick. I mean, that's just drag and drop reboot, right? That's exactly right. And then you have um, the driver thing that you talked about. You have the networking, which is now done in the cloud. Uh, portability, maybe, maybe the portability is not just the roll forward and back, but it's, you know, take it to a different cloud and change the tools out right. all of a sudden. And then you take something like maybe VMware on top of Azure, on top of AWS. And, and now I don't even have to change the tools because the, the hypervisor layer is the same from one to the other. You know, maybe, maybe, maybe you're talking me into PVS in the cloud. <laughs> you know, I thought it was crazy to begin with. No, I mean, I see the, the, the benefit of it. You know, the benefit of it doesn't really change whether you're talking about cloud or on-prem when you're involving virtualization. But I think the biggest, the biggest uh, driver of this where we're going to see it used in the cloud is for those folks that are most familiar with PBS on-prem. Um, you know, historically, well, let me back up. We, we, I don't see it very often in projects. Uh, usually it's customers that already have it or that are, that are wedded to it. Um, we don't really very, very rarely, maybe one or two projects over the three years I've been here, I've actually seen a, a, a PBS implementation from the ground up. Uh, the vast majority of them or all of them pretty much are MCS now because it's just simpler, easier. You're talking about smaller workloads in most cases. If you're talking about multi-thousand workloads, I can certainly see where PBS would fit maybe better and easier than the storage requirements for MCS. Yeah. Hey, let me share my three and two of them with the same customer, PBS nightmare story. So maybe it'll help somebody down the road. Uh, one, those big labs I was talking about a while ago, when, when, the, uh, when the time came for the students to come back, this was during the summer, we rolled it out, no problem. Uh, we had a gig to the lab from the PBS server that was in the data center, which is plenty good enough. Um, and, but, but then when the students came back, all of a sudden that gig went down to like 10 megs because it was all carved up. And if it was available, we'd use it. But if it wasn't available, we got limited to our, our 10 10 megs or whatever it was to those labs, the big one, uh, that was a nightmare. And then in two cases, I had situations where there was an antivirus in play that tried to look at every file every time, even though it had already checked them once, it wanted to look on, and we had 20, 30, 40,000 retries per boot times. In one case, it was a couple hundred machines. In one case, it was a couple thousand machines. Mm -hmm. um, there's lots of little nuances that can bite you in PVS that, that probably bite you in MCS too. You just it just all happens in the storage layer so fast you don't maybe even notice it being a problem. Exactly. Yeah. Just got just got to be on your you got to mind your p's and q's when you're doing PBS and, and when it all lines up it it is kind of beautiful how it works even today. It absolutely is. So in the cloud, so is this Citrix's easy answer for legacy admin so that this uh, this one image can can go all over the place in the cloud or clouds even including your own data center. Um, I guess that's really the, the the magical piece here is to have that that legacy technology that that is still applicable when you need it. Yeah, I think lots of customers have been asking for this. The ones that you know have got larger environments or that are wedded to PVS from years of use, uh, and really want to continue with that that ease of management um, as they see it uh, in in the public cloud, and that coupled with their um, uh, their their imaging service that they're going to be the image portability service right there on the screen. I don't want to get ahead of us, but I think a couple those two together will allow you to move those images from one public cloud to on-prem or, or the other way or from cloud to cloud eventually. Yeah, it's interesting to watch the two companies, Citrix and VMware, kind of compete for the space. Citrix is in traditional Citrix fashion, trying to make it where it can work in different on different platforms. Right. Uh, VMware is trying to, you know, just own all the platforms or be, a, be relevant in all the platforms. So they're exactly. running vSphere or ESX in all the different platforms and portability is kind of native, whereas Citrix is trying to make it where you can pull it out, check it out, and then stick it, you know, somewhere else as needed. And they'll handle, they'll handle the, um, the layer that needs to happen to make it work from layer from you know platform to platform it's, it's exactly. going to be fun to watch this it's going to be really fun to watch this but you're right you know with vmware cloud on aws and on azure and the whatever it's called on google they you know and then you've got on-prem so the the ability to demotion or migrate workloads from one place to the other really is not any different than it was in the days where you had it in one data center or another data center um, it's really simple. Um, Citrix, I think, like you said, is taking the, the approach that we want to allow you to not have to have all that infrastructure and pay for all that infrastructure. Just use what you have now and we can move the images around. Um, right. If you decide to go from Azure to AWS or you have presence in both of them, uh, what have you. Hey, you know, I think, I think a lot of the vendors on the EUC side have realized that uh, managing that compute so that it's not just sitting there running for no reason 
in the cloud is really near and dear to making these things successful. Not, not technically successful, but financially successful, which I think has a lot to do with um, how the cloud use cases will, will evolve. Yeah, there's always that concern, obviously, about cost and being able to mitigate that by shutting machines down with the MCS on Azure in particular. I know when, uh, when that machine shuts down, it literally pulls it out of the environment. So there's not even, you're not even paying for a storage cost for that VM if you set it up right. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, so if you've got you know, 500 VMs in it, and at um, 7 o'clock at night, you only need 100 um, if in the old days you spun them down, they, they, the bits were still sitting on storage, even though it was not much in the way of storage. Uh, in, in MCS on Azure, the machine's actually gone. The machine object's still there, but the actual storage is, is um, discarded. So you're not paying for that storage use. So you'll, you'll probably find this funny. I'm, I'm the guy that's almost 50 years old. It's hard to say. Uh, almost 50 years old that uh, still has that reoccurring dream that I forgot to turn in an assignment in, in college uh, and I wake up in a night sweat. I, uh, I, I have a similar, but not exactly, but a similar um, idea of being back to being a Citrix administrator in the modern world of where we're living today and, and not having stuff in place to turn down machines on Friday so that over the weekend we're not paying for consumption. I, I just had this reoccurring vision of walking in Monday morning going, oh crud, we just spend an extra three thousand dollars we didn't have to spend uh obviously there's tools to, to, to make. yeah yeah i mean i you know i have an azure lab that i use from time to time and most of the folks on my team have an azure lab and i've pretty much told everybody when you create a vm set the flag on it that turns it off at 5 p.m or 6 p.m there you can actually you know set a you know, enable a setting on each vm individually uh, of course you can do it via policy as well but yeah that's it's always a big concern, particularly when you're doing a lab environment, if you're building six or eight VMs, if you leave them all running over a weekend, that can add up pretty quick. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's, it's a waste, waste, waste of money. Big time. So, you know, that's interesting because I know you were in the office last week and I gave you uh, some servers for the team to use for their uh, on-premises, aka home lab. Um, you know, I think we live in a world where we've got to, we got to know how it works in both and we got to know how it works in both at the same time. Um, now we need, now we've got PVS that we can, we can use in both. Exactly. Uh, and some of the guys on your team will, they'll, they'll love setting that up in both. Um, and some of them will probably just run MCS and be done with it. Yeah, probably. But I, I'm sure there are some that will set it up in both once they're aware, if they're not already aware of the uh, the availability, or at least in tech preview of PBS on, a, on a public cloud. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a good point. It is still in tech preview, right? Yes, yes. Well, Bill, did, is there anything about PVS in general that we didn't cover here, and specifically PVS in public cloud infrastructure um, that you want to bring up? Um, no, nothing that I can think of off the top of my head here. Yeah, no worries. I, I think it's pretty much a straightforward thing now that you now you that you think about how it works. Um, I, I guess I do have some 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 not well some concerns or some some uh, wondering about you know the pixie boot piece and are you booting from a, 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 a iso or are you booting what are you booting from in order to get those helper addresses so that pixie actually works yeah i think you're actually i think the requirement is it does support uefi boot on gen 2 machines okay. uh, and i think i remember reading but i can't find it right now that uh you would be using a, a, a boot disk a boot iso attached to it as opposed to doing i don't think pixie's supported at least not now um, there'll be some form of a boot ISO required, but I might be wrong there. Well, you just said two things, right? Boot ISO and boot disk, depending on which one of those it is, would be a very interesting different yeah. scenario. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, if people are listening and they want to talk about PVS and want to reach out to us and uh, just jump on a call and kind of talk through the many, many years we have of trying to understand how it works and what to overcome, I'll tell you, okay, oh, I got to tell you my favorite PVS story. I don't think I've ever done on this uh, podcast. Uh, we, we were using PVS in that lab and for virtual app and desktop, uh, aka Zen desktop at the time. And uh, the, the company I was working with at the university, uh, over the weekend, they changed their DHCP system to go from Microsoft DHCP to another third party DHCP. And one of the flags that the DHCP server would set was release your IP on shutdown. So before the machines would shut down, uh, they would release their IP address, which was not good for PVS. And it would literally be like yanking the hard drive out right. 20 seconds before the machine would totally shut down. That was a nightmare. Luckily, the guy I was working with knew the environment well enough 
after two weeks to be able to figure out what had happened. Um, you know, and the networking team's like, oh, we didn't change anything. We didn't change anything. We didn't change anything. <laughs> um, that's, that was a, a funny story, kind of, um, but very, um, very common. Not, not necessarily that use case or that scenario, but, you know, networking changes make massive impacts on the PBS world. They, they, they definitely will. Like that example I cited, it, it actually took the customer to get somebody in there with a sniffer. Yep. figure out what was going on and uh, they actually found the cable that literally ran around the, the the floor panels it wasn't under the floor it was a raised floor data center but somebody had interconnected two switches and it just re and they were wondering why performance once the desktops booted yep. performance was it would start off okay but then it would just get terrible just really slow and latent and as soon as they yanked those cables everything went back to normal Yes, slightly uh, similar, but different. My first rollout of, of VMware uh, ESX, I'd done a pilot, worked fine. Uh, and then we had to cut over on a uh, Saturday night uh, of the, um, the physical file servers to virtual file servers. And I was doing a robo copy and uh, the pilot was great. Got done in like an hour. Uh, the, the actual rollout, uh, well, POC was great. And then the, the actual rollout was, um, it took, 20 hours for all the data to copy over and I couldn't figure out why. Uh, and then I walked in the next day and the networking guy who was not my biggest fan um, was with me. And we went to, to touch the ports where he had plugged it from the patch panel into the switch ports. And one of the two ports, when I pushed it, you heard it go click and it didn't, it wasn't actually seated. Oh, so wow. it would retry, 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 retry over and over and over again. Uh, we almost kicked VMware out because it was not working. And the whole thing was that the network guy didn't actually push the RJ45 connector all the way in. <laughs> wow. Little life lessons. Oh yeah, for sure. Well, Bill, uh, anything else going on in your world you want to share while we got, uh, got some listeners? Um, no, not really. Just, uh, you know, keeping things moving. Any customers need help with uh, services side, configuration, design, implementation, let, let me know. Give me a call. Send me an email. Yeah, definitely reach out to us. Your salesperson is in yep. tech. Um, yep. tricks and tell the situation person you want to work with us. And then I guess, you know, we never really do this, but, uh, you know, as we grow, we're going to be looking for more people to join us. You know, feel free to hit myself or Bill up on LinkedIn and exactly. let us know if you're interested someday in, in working with us and if you like what we do and our focus on the EUC space, that would be, uh, that'd be great. Hopefully. Yep. Make it All right. Well, with that, uh, I'm heading off to uh, HIMS. I'm going to be working with Citrix at the, uh, not HIMS, but the EduCause conference. EduCause, yeah. So getting back to getting in person and man, I've, I've missed it. Uh, it's also very exhausting, but uh, I certainly missed it. Yep. It's uh, definitely to see it, good to see it starting back up. I really enjoyed those visits we had when you were up here with the, some customers and some Citrites. Uh, it was uh, nice to get back in person. Absolutely right. Yeah. All right. Well, with that, we'll wrap this one up and we'll do it again uh, next week. Okay. Thanks, Bill.